Let's have a little look at electromagnetic induction and magnetic flux. So what you're seeing now is a simulation from the Michigan State University Lectures Online site. And it's just a loop of wire being moved into a magnetic field. The two ends of that loop of wire are connected to a voltmeter here. And so we can read the voltage that's produced around that loop. Now, most of the time, the voltage, if you're looking here, most of the time, the deflection is zero. And you're not getting any voltage at all. It's only starting here when the loop moves through into the magnetic field. That's the only time. So right starting here, it's moving through, and we get the deflection. But once it's out, or when it's in here, then we don't get any deflection of the needle at all. So we're not getting any voltage except basically when the loop is here until it moves to here. Over that time period, we're getting some deflection. At no other time do we get a deflection. Now, in this second, in this second simulation from Florida State University, the motion's the opposite. That is, we've got the magnet moving into the coil rather than the coil moving into the magnet. We've also got all of these little compasses. And remember, the compasses are like tiny little magnets that will detect magnetic field. And what we're really interested in here is what are the compasses doing that are inside the coil itself? Right? And you can see they're not moving at all until the magnet here gets quite close. And then they begin to move, and that's where we get the deflection. So while these are moving, we get a deflection. Now they're not moving anymore. We're moving very, very slowly, and we're not getting any, any significant deflection. Now as we move out again, you can see those compasses are moving, and we are getting a deflection. So it's only when the magnetic field inside the loop is changing that we get this deflection. And that's very critical. So it's essential to understand here that it isn't simply the magnetic field through the loop that causes this voltage that drives current. The essential idea that we need to understand here is that it's the change in the magnetic field that produces that deflection indicating a voltage around the loop. Now, if we're going to understand electromagnetic induction, it's very helpful to have a visual picture of what's going on. And we already have a nice visual way to represent the magnetic field. So for instance, in this case here, the field lines are coming out of the page indicated by the point of the arrow. So we would say that the magnetic field was out. And that may, the strength of that magnetic field would vary as the line density. So if our lines were closer together, that would indicate a stronger field. Now, we're going to introduce a new quantity called the magnetic flux. And we're going to give it a symbol, Greek letter phi. Now, magnetic flux will concern both the fact that we've got a magnetic field, but also the fact that we've got a loop. And so what we can do is take our loop and, let's say, put it into the magnetic field. And for the flux, essentially what we do is we ignore all the field lines outside of the loop. They're not important. The only field lines that are important are the ones inside the loop. So as a nice representation, the magnetic flux here will be proportional to the number of lines through the loop. So right now we've got four lines through our loop. If we had had eight lines through our loop, that would represent twice as much flux. And then let's say that we rotated our loop. If we rotated our loop, we might have a situation where we've only got two of the flux lines actually going through the loop. And so we'd have less flux. So we'd have half as much flux in that situation. So here's four very common situations where we've got a coil or a loop of wire. And an EMF is produced in that loop because the flux through the loop is changing. The first two animations that we saw were examples where we have a relative motion between our coil and the magnetic field. So let's imagine we've got a coil here. And let's make it move to the right. And let's suppose that it enters into some region here where there's a magnetic field. And we'll say the magnetic field is into the page. So if there's a magnetic field into the page, we'll represent that with the axis. So now as we 
move our coil into that loop, right now we've got three flux lines and then we've got six flux lines and now we've still got six flux lines so that would be no change in the EMF and now we've only got three so now we're going to get an EMF in the opposite direction and then as the coil leaves the magnetic field we'll have further change in the flux through the loop, in the number of field lines through the loop. Now how big that EMF is going to be will of course depend on how quickly the coil is moved through. So if it's moved through quickly you'll get bigger EMFs. If it's moved through slowly you'll get smaller EMFs. We might have a loop and we just suddenly turn on the magnetic field. Let's say the magnetic field is into the board. Then we'd suddenly get this increase in the number of field lines through that loop. It would be very sudden and we should generate a, a large but very brief EMF in that loop. Or we can rotate a loop in a magnetic field. So let's once again pretend that our magnetic field is into the board. So when the loop is in this orientation then there's lots of flux through that loop. But as the loop rotates this position here then of course now there's less field lines in the loop through the loop and that means less flux we're changing the flux we're going to get an EMF and then if we rotate to this position now there's no field lines through the loop and so we're having continual change as that loop rotates around you get a continual change of flux through the loop a continual change in the number of field lines through the loop and that's going to produce an EMF. Of course, the faster you rotate that loop, the bigger the EMF is going to be. Another common example is if you have, say, a magnetic field. Once again, we'll put the magnetic field going into the board, like so. And so the loop is going to be formed around here. But now we've got a moving rail. So let's suppose we move that rail across. And of course, as we move across, some of the field lines are no longer passing through our loop. The area in this case is changing, and by changing the area, we're changing the number of field lines through the loop, and that's going to produce an EMF around the loop. Now, of course, we're going to want to do more than just calculate the magnetic flux. We want to do more than treat this qualitatively. We'd also like to treat this quantitatively and that means we'd like to have a formula for our magnetic flux. And we said that magnetic flux was proportional to the number of lines through the loop. And the number of lines through the loop has to be proportional to the magnetic field strength because the magnetic field strength is really the line density. right? So if our line density is bigger we're going to get more lines through the loop. And we can also say that phi has to be proportional to the area itself. If we've got a bigger area, then of course we're going to get more field lines through that area. So we can write that the flux must vary as the magnetic field strength times the area. Now if we choose our units correctly, we can write this as an equality with a proportionality constant of 1. And that's what we do. We say that the flux is equal to B times A our magnetic field would be measured in teslas, our area would be in meters squared, and it would give us a unit of flux equal to the Weber. So this is our formula for the magnetic flux in the case, and only in the case, where this magnetic field is perpendicular to the face of our area. But what about the case where B is not perpendicular to the area of the loop? In that case, we can represent the magnetic field as a vector in the direction of the magnetic field. And we can create a vector that is perpendicular to the face of the loop, which we'd normally call the normal vector. So we've got a B vector and a normal vector. And of course, there'd be an angle between those two vectors. And the only portion of the B vector that contributes to the flux will be the normal component. In other words, if I drop a line down this way and make a right angle triangle, 
then this component here, which I'll call B perpendicular, will be the only part of B that contributes to the magnetic flux. So we can now write that our flux must equal not B, but B perpendicular times the area of the loop. Now, if we take this a little farther and we recognize that this B perpendicular is the adjacent side of this triangle, and of course the length of B here, that's going to be the hypotenuse, that will mean that adjacent over hypotenuse will be the cosine. And that means that this B perpendicular must equal the hypotenuse times the cosine of theta. In other words, a more general expression for the flux is going to be B times A times the cos of theta, where theta will be the angle between the vector B and a vector that's in the direction normal to the area of the loop. Now we want to introduce one more idea called the flux linkage so that we'll be able to express this idea of magnetic induction with a very concise mathematical statement. And that mathematical statement is known as Faraday's law. The flux, which I'll represent by the small letter phi, we saw that that was equal to B times A times the cos of theta. And it's just really a measure of the number of field lines that pass through the loop. If we've got something like a solenoid or a coil, then we can have many, many loops. And each one of those loops will have the same current through it, and therefore will have the same magnetic field inside it. And so all those lines, all those field lines, are going to add up. So if you've got two loops, you're going to have twice as many field lines inside the loops. So we introduce this new idea of the flux linkage. And I'm going to use a capital letter phi to represent the flux linkage. But it's simply going to equal n times phi. It's just going to equal the number of loops times the flux per loop. In other words, our formula is going to be n times b perpendicular times a, nba. That should be easy to remember if you're a basketball player. Or we can be a little bit more precise and write that as nba cos theta. So we're now ready to write a very concise mathematical statement of the law of electromagnetic induction, also known as Faraday's law, named after Michael Faraday. And it simply stated that the EMF, the voltage around the loop, will be proportional to the rate of change of that magnetic flux linkage, delta phi delta t. Now, if we take this a little bit farther, as you've seen in electricity and magnetism, often the proportionality constants turn out to be 1. And that's the case here as well. So in fact, EMF will be equal to the rate of change of this flux linkage. And usually you'll see a negative sign out here. And we're going to explain that negative sign in the next video. But it is coming from what's called Lenz's Law. So this is something we're going to talk about later. So let's just ex expand this expression out a little bit more. We can write this as EMF is equal to negative delta NB perpendicular A all over delta T. And in most cases, the N, of course, is constant. We don't change the number of loops. So we can bring that N outside, and we'll get delta B perpendicular A all over delta t. In other words, it will equal uh, negative n times the rate of change of flux. And now I have a few IB multiple choice questions for you. Pause the video, read over the question, try it for yourself, and then come back for the answer. The first one here, the correct answer is A. We have that very concise statement that the EMF will be equal, in, at least in magnitude, to the rate of change of the magnetic flux linkage. Here's a second multiple choice question. Pause the video, read it over, try it out, and then come back for the answer. Okay, so we know that EMF is going to be maximum when the rate of change of phi is maximum. So we're really looking for where do we get a maximum slope in this line? And right here we've got a slope of zero. Slope equals zero. Right here, that's quite steep. Slope of 0 here, and then at T4, that's quite steep again. 
So T2 and T4, they're equally s steep. The magnitude of this slope is the same at T2 and T4. So the best answer, the right answer, is B. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.